I love the song about needing Christ, as I think that was an appropriate song for our message today. The fact that we are a needy people, and uh, it's important to be needy in that sense because we know that God is the only one that can be able to fill that void. That was what the Reformation was all about. In fact, the Reformation was like a torrential gale that swept over the ruffled harbor of Catholicism. The turbulence was caused by men who were determined to bring religious reform to the church. If you can think about that, roughly in the year about 300, the Roman Catholic Church had taken Christianity and and mingled it with paganism, and the true gospel was lost for many, many years. The champions of biblical truth caused more than a tempest in the ecclesiastical uh, teapot, as you would call it. These champions stirred up a storm of the most powerful dignitaries in all of Europe. And as a consequence, they endured wrath of both royal reprisals and papal persecutions. The Roman Catholic Church was at war with the true gospel. But those steward men were intimidated out of the stormy waters. A mighty ship hoisted its sail, setting a courageous course into the virgin seas en route to a new world of freedom, hope, and truth. And guiding this massive yet crippled vessel were strong, stubborn men. Men by the name of Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Knox, Huss, Tyndale, Wycliffe. Three flags, three flags flew over their ship. Big broad banners that announced their commitment and all of them taken from Scripture. These courageous men considered these principles so significant they were willing to die for them. You think about the things that are going on in Afghanistan where people are being crucified for their faith. Well, many of them did die, and these were the names of the flags. No sacrifice but Calvary. No priest but Christ. No confessional but the throne of God. So those three banners adorned the Reformation and it took it by storm. The same adorned flags can be seen unfolded proudly as we're going through the book of Hebrews. This book, I have to confess, is deep. And there's lots of things in here that begin to go beneath the surface. And, and we're going through some of those waters. These are truths that I think we all know, we all agree with, but the stuff we're going to be looking at today penetrates into the recesses of how we get through life. Everybody just wants to know the simple question, how do I take the Bible and apply it through the stuff that I'm going through? Whether it's loss, whether it's going through testing, whether we're going through a time of difficulty, maybe within a family. All of the principles and all of the truths that we are going to be looking at this morning in our text are useful for you and I to be able to pull out so that we can exist. And I'm going to tell you folks, things are getting more difficult as we go on. It seems like every time you turn around, there's, there's something else that's happening. And so we need this. We're needy people in this regard. Let's take a look at the text first as we look at this in Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse number 14. And if you have your Bibles opened, you will notice the subheading, Christ is our high priest. That is the theme that we're going to be looking at. Verse number 14, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, 
There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Just think. Every one of us has a time in which we need it most. The time when we're going through the most difficult of struggles. The times in which we find ourselves seemingly alone, confused, going through the turbulent difficulties of life. There are those times when we have an advocate. Jesus had said that he's not going to leave us as orphans, that he is going to provide for us a paraclete, a helper, a comforter. And Jesus here speaking specifically to the situation that was happening to the church in which the author of Hebrews is writing. People who are at the stage of breaking. Do you realize that in this room right now, everyone has a breaking point? It's a scary thought. But everyone has that one spot in which we cannot bear one more thing. And yet we have the promise that says, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. He's faithful. When I come to that point in which it feels as if we're giving up, Harry and I this morning before the church service were talking of some of the people that we have seen in the past that had given up. And one of them that was kind of shocking to us was Robin Williams. Many of you remember who Robin Williams is. A guy that was always funny. He was always cracking jokes. And yet came to the point in his life where, I think Harry put it, he had no more shelf space. There was nowhere else for him to go. He came to some type of a point in his life where he finally just could not take one more thing. And unfortunately, the tragedy is is that the only answer he could find in the midst of that difficulty was to take his own life. This is where Hebrews comes in. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we find our help in our time of need. So I'm going to work through this with you this morning. If you have your notes with you, our goal, as we've been looking at after the last several weeks, is resting in the Lord. For the first 13 verses of chapter 4, the writer has been discussing this topic of rest, and and we look at rest from really two specific aspects. We saw this last week. There's the promise of the physical rest that was given by God for the Israelites to go into the promised land. And then rest number two was what kind of a rest? A spiritual rest. The kind of rest that would have helped Robin Williams. The kind of rest that would have helped many of people to get through those times in their life when they had nothing else to offer. Now within the context of our time in Hebrews, again, these Jewish converts are facing very, very difficult times. And let me just say something, folks. We have no clue yet what those times are like that they faced. Not one of us here this morning can really respond on how we would face if somebody is coming at you with a gun and they have your children and they're going to murder you or murder your children. What kind of decisions would have to be made in a situation in which you were really pushed against the wall. It's easy on a Sunday morning in Michigan, in this nice church, to be able to say that we would be able to do it. I sense that in the days to come, there's going to be more tests. I think we've already had tests, and it's, and it's shown the constitution of some people. We got more coming So this is very, very applicable to us this morning. One of the things that was happening with these Hebrews is that they were under the oppression of a guy by the name of Nero, who, by the way, used the bodies of Christians to light his gardens. As a result, some of the newly converted converts were having second thoughts about following Christ. And when the pressure mounts we begin to see that which is solid and that which is genuine. 
The book of James says that the testing of our faith proves what kind of material we are made out of. So look at your notes. The author of Hebrews has been taking and talking about the need for spiritual rest and to be able to relax in the supremacy of Christ. That's really what it's all about, the supremacy of Christ. Notice the second bullet, to turn over to him their worries and anxieties. By the way, it's easy to preach about turning your worries and anxieties over to God. It's easy to talk about it. It makes good preaching. But it's very difficult to do when the test hits. Look at the third bullet. Turn over to Christ the stress and the strain of the battle. That's why Wednesday nights are so important. Boy, we really deal with a lot of stuff that goes on and hits us. And then finally, to enter into the resting place of relief. Boy, there's nothing like a restful point in which at the end of all of the prayers, you can rest and know that it is placed at the throne of Jesus Christ. Now, as we have already seen, we obtain rest for our souls when we leave our churning with him, when we enter into his presence with confidence, when we wait for him to work things out on his timetable, all the while we refuse to presume or panic or let pride get in the way. We called it the three Ps. Now, last week we saw that to be diligent in entering God's rest, we cannot begin that battle without the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, God's double-edged sword to be used as an offensive and defensive weapon in battle. Now, what I want us to do is look at number two in our notes, our need for calling on the Lord. And this, of course, directly is related to the text previously. Look at verse that is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and the marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And look at verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So then when verse 14 starts, so then, therefore, and this is the focus. Showing us our real selves is now the pinnacle to the section as we come to verse 14. Look at it carefully. So then, since all of this is true, since we have a high priest, not just any priest, a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. And notice the command. Look at it carefully. Let us Hold firmly to what we believe. The writer believed, look at your notes, that Jesus' high priestly ministry on behalf of the believers, correctly understood and implicitly believed, would be a great anchor in the coming storms. It is the beautiful imagery of a ship at sail in stormy waters. And the idea is, is to take the great anchor and throw it overboard so that the ship begins to steady. And the idea is, is it forms this anchor of strength in the difficult storms of life. You can just see the imagery of a powerful anchor of Jesus Christ working in and through our lives. And so to dramatize the greatness of Christ's priestly ministry, the author here, listen carefully, he contrasts it with the ministry of the Levitical priesthood who once a year separated himself from the people and entered the Holy of Holies. If you could remember downstairs where we have the ark, and if you go to the other side, that would be considered the holies, the most holy place. And then there would have been a curtain in front of that particular tabernacle. And a priest, once a year, on behalf of the people, would go in and enter into it. Now, what was really scary about this is the priest went in there, first of all, to offer sacrifices for his own sin. But then he would have to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. 
And what they did, and if you have it in your notes, you will notice I put in there a couple of different representations of the priest's robe. You can see it here. One of the things that they had done is on the breastplate, you have this particular gemstones that represent all 12 of the tribes of Israel. You can go to the next one, Deb. The next one here shows in more detail all the uh, parts of it. Somebody had talked about this. In fact, I think it was in our men's Bible study. We had talked about this thing called the Urim and the Thummim. And there's the picture of it uh, coming up there. The Urim and the Thummim was put on the breastplate, and it was kind of a yes or a no. You could find out God's will, and you cast the stones, and whatever one appeared was either a yes or a no from God. Notice it's black and white. Black and white. No in-between, no trying to figure out, well, maybe, and no situation ethics. Black and white. In fact, gray areas are gray because they got white mixed with a little black. It's black and white. Now, what is interesting is when this priest would go into this place, what they would do is they'd have these little bells at the bottom of their robe. Why do you think God put those bells there? To tinkle nice when they walked? No. He had a rope tied to him, and when he went in there to the most holy place, if he did not come with a pure heart, if he came with any sin, he would drop dead. And the only way they'd know if he dropped dead is if they heard a bunch of jingling. And then they'd take the rope, and they would pull him out of there. How would you like to be nominated for high priest that year? I don't know about you, but I think I'd, I'd give it some second thought. The idea was is that it was such a holy place before the very tabernacle of God that this priest would go one time a year and he would offer a sacrifice for the people. And so the contrast that the author, who is very, very familiar with being a Jew, understands the importance of the practice of the Levitical priest. This was something that was very, very important. And so this contrast would be there. Listen to what John MacArthur says. The priests of ancient Israel were appointed by God to be mediators between himself and his people. Only the high priest could offer the highest sacrifice under the old covenant, and that he did once a year on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. All the sins of the people were brought symbolically to the Holy of Holies where blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat that is below those angels, right on the top of that cover, as a separate sacrifice to atone for them. As no other human instrument could, this priest represented God before the people and the people before God. Isn't that amazing? So this priest had a very, very important job to do. The high priest's apparel was designed specifically by God in Exodus 28. And each part, if you go home, you can kind of study all the pieces of that uh, garment. And it symbolized a specific function of how God would atone for people's sin. So this was a really big deal. Now what we're going to see in detail today is the contrast of Jesus who is our high priest, who passed once for all, separated himself from the people in the ultimate holy of holies, which was the cross of Calvary where he shed his blood. The ultimate atonement would be sacrificed once for all. Now, the difference between the old Levitical priest and Jesus is the old Levitical system separated the people from the high priest. In relationship, listen to this carefully, with Jesus Christ, we have bold access to Christ. And that's the whole point of our lesson. There is no need for another mediator. There is no need for an earthly priest. We now, symbolically, spiritually represent a priest that is able to go before the Holy of Holies and the Holy Spirit that dwells within us and have absolutely perfect communion. In fact, the text says boldly before the throne. It doesn't mean arrogantly. It doesn't mean disrespectfully. It means confidently. To be able to go before God's throne of grace. And guess what, folks? We have the privilege of doing that. 
not only in our own one-on-one time, but we have the opportunity of doing it when we gather on Wednesdays, when we gather on Sundays. We are collectively going before the great high priest. (laughs) Have you ever thought of that? The details of what is involved in what Hebrews is teaching us is that this high priest lives to intercede for you and for me. Now notice in your notes, because the word of God shows our need for Christ, there are two main reasons why we shouldn't be hesitant to call on God for divine help. Notice the first one, because we have a priest who is available. You don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to go into a confessional. You don't have to go before a priest. He is right there at our disposal. Number two, we have a confessional that is accessible. We don't have to go to a priest to confess our sins. I remember as a young Catholic boy, I remember doing it one time. I was probably about eight years old. And uh, I had to go into the confessional. And since I was too scared to go in there, my mom went with me. So I would go in there and, you know, I'd say, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I stole cookies and I shouldn't have stole them. And I teased my sister and I said some bad words, you know. And then I got to hear my mom's confession. <laughs> and she goes to the priest, you know, he's here just to hear my confession. But there's no need for that. The idea is is that we have a high priest that we can bear our souls to when we blow it. When there's those opportunities in our life when we need his help, we don't have to worry about having to go to anybody. We simply go to Jesus Christ. No sin is so great that it would turn the head of our high priest from us. Therefore, there is no reason why we should hesitate to come to him in our time of need. It's incredible. Now, before we can confidently draw near to Jesus, there are a few questions that we need answers. And what we are going to do is work our way through some of these things, these details to appreciate more these truths about approaching Christ. And this will help us, folks, to be able to rely on him more. Here's the first question, A in your notes, who is this high priest? This is an obvious one. We all know this, obviously. Look at your notes. Jesus Christ, he is no ordinary human priest. He is the son of God. In fact, look at your notes. He is at the right hand of God the Father. I love this. Look at it. Always making intercession on our behalf. What is intercession? He's talking for us. He's speaking on our behalf. You've got the accuser of the brethren, which is Satan, trying to accuse us, make us feel guilty. And Jesus is over there as our great defense attorney saying, wait a minute. Now, I want you to see this because most of our corollary truth that is connected to this thought is in the book of Hebrews. To turn over to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And notice, if you will, beginning with verse number 23. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 23. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He, look at, lives forever to intercede with God on my behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need. Because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But, look at it, Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice, the propitiation for the people's sins. It's incredible. 
This is exactly what he has done. A description, not just a high priest, but a perfect high priest that intercedes on your behalf. And the qualifier for this intercession is at the end of verse 14. Back to our text there. Look at verse 14. Hold firmly to what you believe. Hold firmly. It's an interesting word in the original Greek. It is the word kratako, and it literally means to use strength to seize something, to lay hold of something, and to hold on to it tightly, to hold it fast. Well, the idea is it's, it's a precious idea of taking a truth and holding it near to your heart. It is something that when the storm comes, you take and you hold on to the truths of Christ, understanding what he has done for us. In fact, it has the idea, look at your notes, of not just holding on, but powerfully holding on because of the strength that God has provided. John MacArthur says, if you could lose your salvation, you would. Because we can't hold on. Only the power of Jesus Christ who works in us and through us gives us the ability to continually hold on to him in the most difficult of circumstances. In fact, look behind me, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. A final word. Be strong in where? The Lord and in his mighty power. It's not our power. We have no power to cast out demons. We have no power to try to do anything or bind or loose anything. All we have is the power to go to our heavenly father who does the work for us. He is the one that is there in his mighty power. Man, I can do nothing. That's why I'm needy. Because I can do absolutely nothing. Nothing. So look at your notes for the second part there. It is God's mighty dunamas, his mighty power that gives us the strength. And again, strength here doesn't come from man's inward determination, but it is the supernatural grace and power that belongs to God's people. Folks, do you know what you have living inside of you? This is awesome. This is powerful. And yet we take it for granted day after day and just walk through life and we need this reminder to help us to understand what it is. So that's who our high priest is. Look at B in your notes. The question number two, what does this high priest have to offer? We know what the Old Testament priests offered. They offered blood of goats and bulls. But there are two things that are listed in verses 15 and 16 that we have as a result of Christ being our high priest. Let me give it to you, and then we'll look at the text. Back to Hebrews chapter 4. The first thing we have is sympathy. Sympathy. Look at verse 15. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Why? Why? For he faced all the same testings we do and yet did not sin. I could do a whole sermon on just that one verse. Let me just give it to you quickly. Christ was tempted in every way that you and I would be tempted. Everything. Somebody asked the question, well, if God cannot sin, was it really a temptation? Yes. In fact, when Christ faced a temptation, it was much worse than us ever facing a temptation because what can happen possibly when we're tempted? We can give in, right? There's at least an opportunity for us to give in. Christ could not give in because he had no sin nature. There was nothing corresponding that would ever allow him to sin, yet he feels the full weight of it. And the only thing I can possibly do, and I was going to ask Bob if he could take a hammer and smash my finger, but do you remember what happens when it happens? Oh, it's just a terrible thought, Bob, just to think about it. You smash a finger, it turns all black, right? And then something really cool gets to, get to happen. You get a, a pin, and you, you get it all hot, and you put it on top of that, and it's just throbbing in there, throbbing, throbbing, throbbing. And you take a pin, and you hit it, and what happens? Psh! All of the pressure is released. With Christ... The pressure couldn't be released. So he felt the full weight of the sin 
without the ability to sin. So therefore, his suffering was much worse than ours. And so, he suffered in every way. He had the same types of things. He can sympathize with us. It's not like you can say, well, you're, you're Jesus, you can handle it. No, he was fully human, remember? Fully God, fully human. He still had the ability to feel the weight of the temptation, but yet not even with the possibility of being able to sin. That's why the Bible says, yet without sin. The reason that's put in your Bible is because it's saying it's impossible for him to sin, so it made the temptation worse. Does that make sense? It was worse. Sympathy. And that's the first benefit. It's the most comfort for those who are going through difficult waters. Are you sad this morning? We, we have folks that are, that are dealing with sadness. Jesus, remember, wept for Lazarus. He felt the full weight of human suffering and loneliness. He felt it. You're not alone. He's been there. He's done that. It's interesting, the word here that we have, understands, look at your notes there, understands, sympathizes. It is the word here, sympathio. And it literally means to suffer with. That's the important part. Suffer with. The word sympathy that we have in our scriptures is not just that Jesus looks down and sees you suffering. No, he is actually experiencing the suffering with you. He's going through it with you. So you're not alone. When our hearts are crying, when our hearts are sad, guess what? Jesus is experiencing the same sadness with you. Why? What's living in you? The Holy Spirit, right? And since the Holy Spirit is living in you, don't you think he feels the same thing you feel? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that gives us comfort of knowing that this high priest is able to sympathize with us. Listen to this. Commentator writes the depth of, sympath of sympathy. Jesus, our high priest, has an unequal capacity for sympathy. It goes far beyond the intellectual because it is truly experiential. Jesus does not just imagine how we feel. He feels it. And the word for sympathize means to share the experience of another as it's happening to them. To sympathize through common experience, the most sensitive man who ever lived feels with us. Whatever we may be going through, there is not a note that we can play, not a melody or a dirge, no minor key, no discordant note that does not evoke a sympathetic response in Jesus. He goes on to say, he mastered the instrument while he was here on earth and he wears it in heaven do you want sympathy? Do not go anywhere else. Go only to him, unquote. He doesn't just look down from heaven and say, hey, Werner's in, Werner's in pain here. No, he feels the pain as it's happening. Notice how the same word is used later by the author of Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, a couple pages over to the right. Verse number 32. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 32. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You offered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all of you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew that there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. It is the proper way of looking at the difficulties of suffering. Jesus has been tested as we are tested. He has known the searing sun of the stinging sand, the wilderness. He's felt the full weight of temptation and yet not being able to sin. Look at number two in your notes. Not only do we receive sympathy, but we receive God's presence. Back to Hebrews 4. Look at the beginning of verse 16. 
We're going to take this verse in two parts. Look at the first part. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Let me repeat it. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There again is speaking of this confidence. God's throne is a place of acceptance. The throne of grace. Isn't that comforting? Kind of sounds like a windstorm in here. <laughs> the sympathetic confessional where we find God's love and acceptance. Listen to what Warren Wearsby, he's a great, this guy's a great preacher. Listen to what he says. These verses offer proof that the believer cannot lose his salvation. We have a high priest who knows our temptations and weaknesses, who endure testings that we must endure. When times of testing come, we need but turn to the throne of grace for the help Christ alone can give. The writer will elaborate on this theme in the later chapters. But he puts this exhortation here, lest his readers become discouraged and say, it's impossible for us to go to him or to go on. We simply don't have what it takes. Of course you don't. No believer has strength enough to cross the Jordan and conquer the enemy, unquote. It's incredible. The great high priest. I don't know about you, but that gives me great comfort just in the nick of time God shines through. Notice C in your notes. Question number three, why does Christ qualify? Why does Christ qualify? Again, Jesus qualifies to be our high priest because, look at your first bullet, being the Son of God, he perfectly represents divinity. He perfectly represents divinity. And at the same time, he is fully man. Jesus represents humanity. And then finally, he is appointed by God to offer sacrifices for sin. Let me turn this off. Wow, it's still thundering in here. All right. Now let's take a look. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. Don't let the enemy distract you with anything that's going on with sound. He's trying to get your mind off what we're looking at. This is very important. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse 1. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. He is, there's our word again, able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why we must offer sacrifices for his sins as well as theirs. The difference with Jesus is that he doesn't have the weakness of the Old Testament prophets. As a perfect high priest, Jesus did not have to go with his own sins because he had none. So the one who understands us perfectly will also provide for us perfectly. Jesus Christ knows our temptations and will lead us out of them. I quoted this verse already. It's behind you here. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'll give it in the one I memorized. No temptation shall overtake you, but what is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond which you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, as this relates within the context of these Jewish converts who are wavering, the Holy Spirit appeals to those who are yet undecided about their, about their Savior. So let's picture it. Here you are, the Jewish people are all worried about the problems that they're going to face, and they're saying, should I follow Christ? Should I not follow Christ? Am I going to stumble? Am I going to lose my family? Am I going to get killed? What am I going to do? What decision do I need to make? Do I stay or do I go? And no, I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> the idea here is, is that this is an incredible test. He stands ready to hear their pleas. He's ready to hear their petitions. And he's ready to associate these people in their pain. 
So the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, guys, don't waver. Listen to this. I, I had... I love Marilyn. She, she plays anything you put in front of her. And uh, I was going to choose this song, but uh, there's nowhere you can find it, really. It's called Arise, My Soul Arise. And if Marilyn hasn't heard it, then ain't not many people heard it, okay? But the words of this was written 250 uh, years ago by Charles Wesley. And I want you to see the words of it. Take a look. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off my guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears before the throne of grace. Grace. Isn't that incredible? The rich theology of the truth. Notice question number four. How does Christ provide? Well, Hebrews says here that we come boldly to the throne. And so, look at your notes. He provides by inviting us to draw near. Because of the king's invitation and the royal promise that he offers, look at it. We can step up on the throne and appear before him. That is no small task. Do you remember the story that was given in the book of Esther? I was going to take us there, but uh, I don't know if we have time to do that. So let me just give you the story in a nutshell. We can skip that slide. But maybe look at it today in the book of Esther. If you remember, Esther was not allowed to just go to the king, even though that she was his wife, right? What had to happen is the king had to take the scepter and put it out, and she had to touch the end of the scepter, and now she could talk to the priest, or she could talk, in this case, to the king. So what this is saying is, in Jewish culture, there was this whole understanding, the scepter that had to be drawn out first. In the spiritual sense, Jesus, as the high priest, extends the scepter, if you will, of his grace. At the end of verse 16, notice two facets of that grace. Look at the rest of verse number 16. There, at the throne of grace, we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. There we will receive his mercy. Our gracious God gives us a threefold blessing. Take a look at it. It's in your notes. Three arrows, very important. Take a look. His mercy, received from the king. His grace, it's supernatural grace. And of course, the most important part, I love it, in our time of need, when the persecution hits. We knew... that Jesus Christ, I had said this before, shows up on a Wednesday. He's going to be our special guest. He's going to be here to lead us in prayer. I bet you there wouldn't be one seat that would be empty. So the reality is, is why don't we believe that? Why don't we understand that we literally are in his very presence? The problem is, is we've got this, this flesh. We can't see him. We can't touch him. And therefore we say, well, because we can't see him, because we can't touch him, then he must be far away. Not true. 
When you put all of these details together, this is what the text is saying to the wavering Jewish converts 2,000 years ago and to the 21st century. Here it is. There are at least three things that the writer intends to remove as obstacles from approaching the Lord's throne. Here they are. Look at it. Number one, to have us free to draw near to the throne of Almighty God. Number two, to come with our prayers and our supplications. And number three, with the immediate intervention of our high priest. Grace is the concept that has many facets, and as it applies here, the grace that God gives is a connection. Look at it with your notes there, with our striving against the sin and difficulty. It's the idea of the grace that Paul found in his thorn in the flesh. Now, I want you to see a truth. This is a golden nugget you're going to see here, okay? This is a golden nugget that you're going to be able to hold on to. I came across this, and it's a phenomenating thing when you think about it. Now listen to this. What was it that Paul had as a thorn in the flesh? We don't know. It was something that attacked him. It was something that he was striving against. Now look at it. It's the idea of the grace that Paul found in his thorn in the flesh. Grace is the divine strength that is working within us. You're saying, wait a minute, that does, I don't get that. How is my problem, how is my difficulty actually working grace within me? I don't want to be here. I don't want the problem. So how can this be grace? How can I be experiencing grace? Grace. Well, let's find out. Look behind us here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's the end of it. Three different times Paul said, I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, now look at the words, my grace is all you need. Now you think, well, that's just a nice statement. No, look at it. My power works best in weakness. Now look at the rest of it. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that, look at it, the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, troubles that I suffer for Christ. And this is it. The whole thing is wrapped up in this statement. For when I am weak, I am actually strong. It's a mystery. It's one of those things. When you endure temptation, trials, difficulty, when you're resisting it, that is actually grace that God has given you to give him praise. You receive praise when you go through difficult situations. No wonder James says, blessed are those who are persecuted. So, what was the grace that Paul experienced freedom from his thorn? No. Power shown in his weakness. Had the weakness, listen folks, let's play this. Had the weakness been taken away, there would have been no power. So these truths should not only keep the Jewish converts from going back into Judaism, but they should hold on to their confession. The confession they had of Christ and go on to draw a confidence to the throne of grace. That brings us to our final part today, our hope in responding to the Lord. The application then is made very clear to us from Jesus' own mouth, and I want to take you to our final scripture. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 11. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. This is so cool. Never saw this before. How many years? It's always been on the page. Never saw it. Jesus is going to relate Hebrews chapter 4 to us here as he relates the truth of God's special blessing on those whom the Father has given the Son. And I love the way this works out. Harry, here's some more red letter for you, okay, that you can underline. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 25. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. Now remember, he's talking to God the Father. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever, for revealing them to the childlike, the ones that are dependent. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. What way? Let's take a look. It says, 
My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son, now look at it carefully, except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Who are the those? The those are in verse 28. Jesus said, come to me all. The all are those who are chosen. Look at the connection. I got a little circle around all, and I got a little circle around those, and I got a little connection, a bridge. Those are the all of verse 28. All of you chosen who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and look at it, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find, look at it, rest for your bodies? No, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Jesus says, listen, when you're in a relationship with me, it doesn't matter what it is you're going through. It doesn't matter how hard the trial hits you. The reality is if you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, He gives you the grace and the power and the ultimate rest to know that it's all good. It's all okay. Nothing can touch you. There's no need for fear. That's why we had to sign the other week, no fear. No fear. Faith, yes, no fear. And I'll say this again, because I think it's going to be needing to repeat as we go into the days to come. You can't die one second before God allows you to die. Okay? So there's no need to be worried and the panic and all the stuff that the media might try to conjure up. Stop watching the television. Please. Trust simply in the fact that Christ is there and there's no reason to fear anything. Jesus makes the clear statement on the ministry of salvation. All who are weary are those that the Son chooses to reveal himself. Who are they? Those that the Father has given to the Son before the foundation of the world. You're a love gift that God decided to give to his Son. And we don't know why God chose to give who he gives. It's a mystery. So what's our responsibility today in light of all of these incredible truths? Well, if you remember the three banners that we saw flapping in the introduction, they're going to lead us to this place of rest. Resting, remember, requires that we approach God. To do that, we need a sacrifice. And the flag of the Reformation tells us how. Are you ready? Here's the first one. No sacrifice but Calvary. No sacrifice but Calvary. Only Christ and what he did in a moment of history frees us. Approaching God means that we must be clean and forgiven. How do we obtain the cleansing? Through the intercessory work of the high priest. Who is that priest? Look at the next one. No priest but Christ. Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. No earthly human priest can give us access to grace. We don't have to go to a human priest today and confess our sins. Why? Third one, no confessional but the throne of grace. It's coming boldly, confidently to Jesus Christ. For the unsaved, if you're here without Christ this morning, it's repentance, forgiveness, complete surrender. For the same.